You ever, uh, you smoke cigarettes or anything like that? No. I mean, growing up, I would do it when I was drunk or whatever. I haven't done it in a while. Yeah. It never had any appeal to me. You smoke weed? I don't know why. Not anymore. I can't. It's too, it's too strong, bro. Yeah. They don't have beginner weed anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I started, I used to, I started really young and, um, I, I, I started doing it less and less because it would just wasn't as fun for me. Yeah. And uh, anytime I tried to get back into it, I would just get too fucking baked. And yeah, I dude. couldn't. Yeah. I'm going to put these headphones on. Actually. Okay. I want to I get in the zone. Yeah, yeah. Do your thing, bro. That's what, um, was, I just actually went. I stopped smoking weed, bro, like fucking almost a week now. A week? It's, it's almost been a week since I stopped, man. I just <laughs> Same thing. It just I've been smoking every day for like 16 years, bro. Wow. Practically every day. So I just had to give it up, especially now doing this comedy thing, man. Like it affects me so much up on stage. Yeah, do you you smoke before you go up? I used to. Dude, I could never do that. But, um, like, obviously, just being three months in, like, nothing, I would get in my own head, and it was just a waste of time and money. You know what mm. I mean? So when I go sober now, it's just, I'm actually having fun and shit. I'm not in yeah. my head. So you would, would you smoke every time before you went up? When I first started, I didn't, and then, like, maybe a month or two in, that's when I started doing it, mm -hmm. and I just saw it affect me way too much. And like I said, I was just fucking throwing away five dollars every time I go to fourth wall. You know what I mean, or any open mic yeah. for that matter. You know, what, why? What, what did you think it was doing for you? Like, why would you just getting in my own head? Like when I wouldn't get a laugh, I'd fucking start just talking to myself in my head. Like I'm not funny. You got to fucking write better. And I'm thinking about right. this shit on stage, bro. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean. Yeah. Where I'm not supposed to be doing <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah. You know. And then I, I just feel like the vibes. Everyone could tell that I'm getting in my own head. For sure. No, I'm saying, why would you do this to yourself? Oh, like, oh why? why did you? What, what did you think you had to gain by getting baked before you go up on stage? I don't know, man. I think at first it was like, okay, it, it helped me relax. You know what I mean? And then the improv I would do okay. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as the open mic would start, when I'd have to actually work on my own material, right. that's when it fucking shit hit the fan. Uh. And then I was just like, never again, dude. I can't do that. Especially now, because like I'm, I'm gonna, I'm like, going 110 percent with this comedy stuff, this podcast right. stuff. So okay, I don't, I don't think weed is a performance enhancing drug with anything really. No, it makes me worse at literally everything. Everything, bro. Yeah. Even when I'm just fucking sitting here, fucking just beating off, I fucking suck at it when I'm high. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Beating off is a little more interesting when you're high. I will say that. It, it, dude, I'm not going to lie. I had a time where... You get a little more in tune with it, but then you'll have these moments where you kind of disassociate, and you're like, dude, I'm just like sitting here with my boner in my hand, and like, it's awkward. You feel like someone's watching you. And then you fucking, it takes you 30 minutes just to find the right scene of a porn. Yes. Yeah. It also feels a lot gayer to beat off when, when I'm high. Is it? Yeah, I'm way more in tune with how innately homosexual it is. <laughs> Not that that's good or bad. I'm just like, wow, this is like a really gay thing to do, because you're just it's just you and your boner, you know. You're yeah. just, I don't know, it's, <laughs> you and your boner. It's pretty intimate. You're just beating someone off. <laughs> it just happens to be you, you know. I don't know. It, it's weird. Like sometimes I'll kind of feel like I'm jacking off somebody else. You know what I mean? Like I think you just we're so used to beating off, we take it for granted. True. But just a little bit of weed, you can zoom out just enough to see how bizarre it is to beat up. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like uh, an out-of-body experience for you. Yeah, huh? It's weird. I haven't done it in a long time, but if I smoked weed now, I definitely would not beat up. That would <laughs> be way too trippy. Are you uh, from California? I am, yeah. Yeah? I'm from Ventura County. Okay. Have you? Do you know? Are you from the area? Ven uh, no, I'm not. I'm from okay. Vegas. Born in Hawaii, raised in Vegas. Okay. Yeah, it's... Yeah, yeah. Um, west. Yeah, yeah. Um, up north, minutes. right? Yeah, like Oxnard? It's just straight west. Yeah, yeah. A little okay. before Oxnard. Okay. Right, yeah, yeah. right on the border of the valley, kind of. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. okay. It's a town called Thousand Oaks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've been there. Have you really? Yeah, Why? yeah. Golf. Golf, oh, bro. That's, that's probably one of the only reasons to go. That That's the... I, I was, like, huge in golf when the pandemic started, dude. Okay. And then... um. That, that's a good pandemic sport, isn't it? It was great, dude, because yeah. everyone was getting fucked up. Everyone's getting high. You know what I mean? And then <laughs> on, the, on the golf course, on the golf course, bro. That's really? the only way to play. I don't feel like golfers are big weed smokers. You'd be surprised, bro. Really? When Tiger came back uh, he, at the Masters, I think it was last year. I don't know if it was like a weed pen, but it, he Rory McIlroy passed Tiger a pen and it looked like a weed pen. Uh -huh. So they'd be doing it because I don't think they even get drug tested, to be honest with you. Yeah, I don't know why they would. I don't think drugs would help that much. Even steroids. It's like maybe you could drive a ball 400 yards, but is that even what you want to do? Yeah, right. When you're golfing? I don't, I don't, golf is, to me, the only thing I've ever gotten out of golf is it's just a good excuse to drink at 10 in the morning. Like, 
It's exactly. And I'm amazed. Pandemic that, sport. Yes. And dude, the amount of beers you can fit in a golf bag is fucking about incredible. 13. About 13. Dude, I had a, <laughs> me and my homie fit a 30 pack in his golf bag one time. What the fuck? But I mean, dude? we only had like three golf clubs in there. So we we're just. Uh, like okay, okay. Towers Stacking of beers. Stacking it. Yeah, I'm terrible. At I golf? Take, yeah. I take 10 mulligans on every hole. You know what a worm burner is? That, no, I've never heard, heard of that. No, that's what. Apparently, it's a slang word for you know when you hit a ball really shittily and it just skips off. Oh, the ground. okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is it called? A worm burner. Worm burner. Because you're just a bunch of earthworms. <laughs> you're just like burning their heads off. You know, <laughs> bing, 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 bing. Is that you? Oh yeah, dude. Worm <laughs> burners, dude. I can't drive a golf ball at all. I get no lift on it. No. No, I just like worm burn. Worm burner, dude. Hit a worm burner and then I'm just like in the middle of the fairway, like chipping it. It takes me like 15 <laughs> shots to get it on the <laughs> fucking on, green. On a par three. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> fucking terrible but i'm hammered so it's fun there you go and driving the golf cart too yeah dude is enjoyable that's so fun that is so fun yeah dude, i don't know how you like what posture to pick with this chair i'm like yeah the back is very low <laughs> you're just like sitting straight i'm up. just kind of chilling you know yeah i feel kind of like doing this but this feels weird too <laughs> i don't think i'm ever gonna get used to it but, yeah. how long you been com- doing comedy bro stand up uh I dabbled in it a little bit in 2015. Okay. Uh, for like a summer, but I only back then I knew two mics, oh, so shit. I would go maximum twice a week. One of them was West Side Comedy Theater. Have you been there? No. That's in, it's in the Third Street Promenade, kind of, but it's in like an alleyway. Okay. It's a cool club. They have a Tuesday mic. It's three minutes. Okay. Um, free? Yeah. Uh, it's it's like a dollar to get in. Oh shit! And what I like about the mic is they will play your ass off at three minutes on the dot. There like, you go. So people and they're that. brutal about it, and it's fun. Yeah, it keeps yeah. the mic moving, keeps you on your toes. I get played off every time I do it. Do you? Yeah, because you just think you're used to getting like a 15 second cushion, and there they're like, True. "No, fuck you." True. Where we're blasting it. Um. So that was the first mic I ever did, and I went there, and then Flappers used to have a late night Friday mic at like midnight. Okay. In the Yuhu room, and it was fun because there'd be a bunch of hammered like audience members left over from the show that mm-hmm. would just like hang out in there. So there was usually people in there. Those were the only two um, mics I knew. So I did that for maybe like three months. So maybe I did it like 20 times. And um, I didn't really have the stomach for it. I was 25. And uh, I would... I remember one night I was at a mic in like Echo Park. I found out about it. It was at this place called the Karma Lounge. Mm -hmm. And it was in this really like trippy area. Actually, it might not even been Echo Park. This neighborhood was like... There were like couches on every corner, like little drug drop offs. Oh shit! Dudes on those chopper bicycles. What the fuck? Like whistling and like lookouts everywhere. So I parked in this Damn. neighborhood and like just walking to the mic was scandalous. There were in people Echo like, Park. This no, oh, I couldn't wait, have been. Like... It, maybe it wasn't. I don't. I don't remember. This was so long ago. But anyway, I get to the mic. There's no stage. There's just an amp in the corner, and uh, there's like four alcoholics at the bar, like hunched over their beers <laughs> with their backs turned to the. Mike, God damn! There were like four comics there. No one was laughing. No one was listening. And my name was in the bucket. And I was new enough that doing a mic at all was scary. Like yeah, my heart yeah, was like, exactly. And I remember sitting there and just thinking, like, why? Why am I doing this? Like, I, I'd been doing comedy sketches, and we just finished one that I thought had a lot of potential. And I was like, I, I had this thought in my head, like, I'm, I don't need to be doing this. Why am I trying to make? these random assholes laugh at a dive yeah. bar on like a Tuesday night at midnight. Like I have better ways to use my time. Right. And so I walked away from it and I didn't do it again for seven years. Damn. And um, I look back on that night a lot because I think the real reason I stopped wasn't because of the story I was telling myself about how my sketch comedy thing was going to take off or I'm writing is way more promising. It was really just because I was scared mm. and it was a hard thing to do. Yeah. Um, and that's that's a shitty reason to not do something. Right, yeah, dude. But I yeah. came back around 7 years later at 32 and I was like, I'm going to do this again. Why did you come back to it? You know, like the sketch comedy thing was fun, but we we were kind of the way we would approach it, we would spend like a year on every video. Holy like, shit, bro. Yeah, and on too much money, and we'd hire whole crews, and we'd make these really elaborate comedy sketches. Not even sketches. These are like short films then. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, they were in the format of a sketch. Okay. We just we, we thought we were hot shots, yeah. and we're like, oh, what if we 
hire a DP yep. and, and spend all this money we don't have. That's how it is, man, making short films. Where did you first start off? Because I was yeah. the same way, dude. I spent thousands of dollars fucking making short yeah. films, man. That's what we would do. And then we would put them on YouTube and they would just kind of sit there. <laughs> they were too long to go viral. They were like five minutes, six minutes, mm. seven minutes. So they would just not get us anywhere. Yeah. And then during the pandemic, I was started screenwriting. Mm. I'd been doing it for like a year, but I was just editing, working from home, screenwriting. So I'd be on my computer for like 10 hours yeah. a day. And I wrote this, the second feature film I wrote, it was like a 130 page screenplay. Nice. And I showed it to my friend and um, I was so hopeful about it. I thought it was like this masterpiece. And I could tell by his reaction <laughs> that he was like, just trying to be friendly. He was just like, and I was like, fuck, dude. What am I doing with my fucking life? And on a lark, I was just like, dude, I'm going to go to a fucking open mic tonight. I hadn't done it in like years. It was like, yeah, five, seven years. Where'd you go? Back to the West Side Comedy Theater, <laughs> which was the only mic I knew still. Because the flappers, you who mic, they didn't do it anymore. Yeah. So I went back to the place where I first did comedy. And it was late December 2021. Mm. Uh, actually, like mid-December. And I remember I showed up there and it was fucking packed. And I was terrified i was like oh i barely made it on time like i i kept i lived all the way in woodland hills mm -hmm. so i was making all these excuses i was like yeah, oh, i'm not gonna make it i'm gonna be late but i got there i hit like every fucking green light <laughs> and i didn't want to i <laughs> yeah. wanted to be you late wanted, like well like, yeah. can't make it all right i'm going back home <laughs> being a pussy but i can't and then right when i get there i'm like oh i'm not gonna be able to park and then of course right when i pull into the parking garage this car and the first spot just backs out and lets me in Life is always doing that when it, you're doing some shit you don't want to do. Exactly. Life is just like, by all means, go for it, you know? Um, so I, yeah, get in there with like a minute to spare and I wrote my name on a piece of paper and I was like, I'm not going to put it in the fucking bucket. And then I did. The way that mic works though, they, 50 people throw their name in and they mm -hmm. draw 25 of them. Then that goes in a second bucket and those 25 oh, people get to go up. So you can go there and not even get in the bucket. Fuck. There's a first bucket, and then they draw 25 names, and then that goes in the bucket of people that are going to get up, mm -hmm. and then they pull for order. So even oh, when I, I threw see. my name in, I'm like, ah, they're not going to call me. I see. I was like the second name they picked. <laughs> I was like, fuck. Dude. And then I was tripping, and then I went up like they call on deck. Yeah. And I got picked like, you know, third or fourth, completely packed. There's when at the beginning of the mic, it's really good. It's yeah. It's full. And so I like went in the bathroom, and it was like, some cheesy eight mile shit. I like splash water on my face. This is just an open mic, but I was like, <laughs> I, I had so much writing on this because I'm like, I'm a failed screenwriter. I can't write a fucking, none of these comedy sketches worked out. I'm fucking 32. I'm a piece of shit. Yeah, man. It's all come, I've washed up here again. And um, yeah, dude, I went up and it kind of like, it went pretty well and I couldn't believe it. Um, like, I don't know. I, I, I tend to kind of, it gets very surreal when I'm in like a high stakes, what feels like a high stakes moment mm -hmm. where it's kind of a blur. Um, and yeah, it, it like went well, like nothing. There weren't any moments that like felt odd or bombed. Like it kind of went how I hoped it would go in my head, mm -hmm. which I really couldn't believe. And then the set, this guy went up after me and he started like riffing off my like the next like four comics were riffing on no my kidding. set. And it became like the theme of this mic. Dude. And I was just like. I don't know. Some about it felt so the way I, I did it kind of on a whim mm -hmm. is this like impulsive decision. The way I'd, I I'd been trying to express myself in all these ways that weren't working out. And I felt so cornered and I'm like, I'm going to run back to this. And the way I just did it on that night and like made it by the skin of my neck, got pulled up there in this full room, the way it's somehow I pulled it off. That mic's scary to me now. Like that mic's kind of intimidating sometimes, but, mm -hmm. um, yeah, some just felt weird about it. Like, if I had bombed that night, I might have never done comedy. Yeah. Again. Like, it was that fragile. I was just like, I'm just going to fucking try this. And and thank God it worked out. Yeah. Because then I, I, I did comedy. I kind of just started doing it again. Yeah. And I, like, didn't stop. Um, and this time it was different. I just, because I had nothing else. Like when I did it before, I was like 25. I had like a cool job editing. Yeah. I was, we we're making all these comedy sketches. We, had all this gear and all these friends. Right. Now I'm doing it again and I'm like penniless. I'm in my 30s. I'm like a fucking loser. And I'm like, I have nothing better than this to do. Bro, same like, here, dude. So honestly. So yeah, I from then on I just kept from like early 2022 on. I I 
just haven't stopped. So, and it's well, I'm glad you haven't, dude, because you're yeah. one funny motherfucker, bro. Thanks, man. Thank Seriously, you. I remember the first time I saw you, it, shit was fire, bro. And it was, I think it was an improv mic at the fourth wall. Oh, but, yeah, I love those. Those are fun. Yeah. But even your fucking, uh, you had this bit fucking like a couple weeks ago about the tossing salad, bro. Mm. That shit is one of the funniest things I've ever heard in my life, bro. Oh, yeah, the butt looking one. Yeah, that, dude. Yeah, that's, you know, it's not for, I, I've done that in certain rooms and I'm like, this is mean. Because if you have a it, shit, this is the problem with going to mics is shit like that really works for comics. Mm. I, I, comics are so jaded that I think if you go to too many mics, you start just getting good at making comics laugh. And the way to do that is usually to be really shocking and kind of gross. Not necessarily shocking, but you to get a comic's attention and get a rise out of them, you got to be a little dark and grungy, I find. And then if you do that too much... And you think like, oh, this shit crushes at fourth wall NoHo at 4 p.m. <laughs> and then you go do it at like a show full of like dolled up women and dudes yeah. with like collared shirts on. They're like, what the fuck is this guy talking about? <laughs> so I, I think, yeah, that that bit's not really a show bit. You know, I mean, <laughs> I've never tried it. I've tried it at a show maybe once, but it gets a lot of groans and you see a lot of old ladies starting to sweat. And like, it's, No kidding, dude. It's pretty gross. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's like a three minute bit about licking buttholes, you know. <laughs> But I think the history and the story of it, like, that's what's mm. funny to me, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, but um, I don't know, to each his own, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there's a time and a place for it. Yeah. It's funny you remember that. I mean, it's, yeah, I haven't done it in a while, but maybe maybe I'll dust it off. Yeah, yeah. dude. Yeah. Um, what's your writing process like, man? Because do, do you find yourself as a writer? Because I noticed, like, with me, I thought screenwriting would translate into this stand-up shit, bro, and sure. it did not whatsoever yeah, yeah, you know what i, I mean and yeah. i don't know like right now three and a half months in i'm struggling with just the not just the writing but the writing period it's just i don't know what to talk about and maybe it's because i don't know my perspective because i don't have enough experience yet right um but i don't know like what's your writing process like it's changing it, it's it's not like a static thing it's always changing um when i first started i was coming off of screenwriting too and so i did approach it like a total writer, like I would hash out every bit on the page, like word for word. Right, exactly. And I would literally go to a mic with a script in my head verbatim. That's like I would trip over like individual words. Yeah, dude. And transitions and syllables. And I would, I would the whole way, I would listen to it over and over and chant it and repeat it. And right. I, I wouldn't go to a mic until I knew a bit word for word. Then I would do it on stage. And now I like, I'm the complete opposite. Like, I can't even bring myself to practice a bit before I get on stage a lot of the time. What, dude? It feels too weird. I f it feels like I'm poisoning something pure. Like, when something's still fuzzy and I have this sense of it in my head, like, I'll, I'll write it down on the page maybe, but there's a purity to, like, exploring it on the moment with the light in your face and the mic in your hand. And the way you would say something in front of a room full of people with a mic in your hand is way different than even the way you think you would do that. Mm. And especially the way you would write it. Like it's, I, I'm, I'm just starting to realize it's a, it's a spoken art form. Mm. And so you can make something that looks good on the page. Right. And what looks good on the page doesn't always sound great coming out of your mouth. It doesn't sound conversational. It doesn't right. sound natural. So I, I go through these phases where I won't, write anything down and i'll just do it on stage and have premises and shit yeah 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 and maybe i'll jot down notes but mm. then when i go too long without writing at all i feel like my my bits get a little bit fuzzy and a little lazy oh, and they're not as structured and they don't hit as hard so then i'll start writing again and i'll go through phases where i only write on a page because something about physically writing it in a notebook right feels like it keeps me a little more grounded right because writing on a computer you can get so carried away exactly it's so easy to exactly and then you can like move things around exactly, and it's dude. too easy to edit and tweak yeah, and man. then before you know you can like take a bit and on a computer in 10 minutes you can move everything around and fuck with it and then have an unrecognizable like salad of shit dude i can't tell you how many times i fucking done that bro yeah right it's and it's way harder to do on the page on the page you gotta like cross everything out and start over yeah it. and it's more laborious so it keeps you it stops you from overcooking shit. You know, it stops you from tinkering too much. Because when you just got a pen and a pad, it's like, all right, if I want to rewrite this bit, I'll just like rip this page out or scribble right. it out and then start from scratch. But even that isn't 
like I just started writing on my computer again and I'm like, fuck, this is way easier. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm always going back and forth. Yeah. I like the notes app on the phone. Yeah, yeah, that's what I use. Too. I have a different note file for each bit. Mm-hmm. Okay. I see a lot of people put all their bits in one right. fucking document, and I think they're maniacs. Because anytime you want to like add a tag, you got to sift through like fucking that's 300 true. bits yeah. to find it. I just have one for each, and then when you fuck with them, they automatically pop to the top, boop, 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 mm. so you can see what you've been working on lately. Um, that's a good note. But I like it's easier to keep track of everything. When I'm doing it all in a notebook, I'll have like 10 versions of each bit in the notebook. And I'm like, which is the newest one? Where the fuck is this? There's chicken scratch everywhere. Yeah. I have like five different notebooks. I can't keep it all. It's so much more manageable on a computer. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. But every time I come back to writing on the computer, I'm a little, I'm thinking of it a little more like a, like a speaker and less like a writer. So I... Yeah, I don't know. It's always evolving. I still don't know. It's some mix of the three now. Like, some shit's in the notebook. I like bringing a notebook to a mic. Right. Because I, I feel rude pulling my phone out exactly, of the mic. Exactly, yeah, I dude. like taking notes and jotting yep. things. Um, but if I'm at home cooking something up, yeah, I'll type it. And then I, 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 I think a good middle ground is to write a bit out, however you like to. Mm-hmm. And then I'll record it. So And then I'll mm-hmm. listen to it. I'll walk around the block and I'll listen to it spoken. Because then I can experience yeah. it like the audience will. Like, this is what this sounds like to hear. Holy shit, bro. That's that, dope. That really helps. And that, So that's like that. phase two for me. Like, phase one is think of the idea, start writing down everything I think could work, organize it, put it in like a rough order. And then if I can get in a space where it kind of feels like something, I'll record it into my phone. And then I'll just stroll around the block listening to it. Like, what does this sound like? And I'm like, oh, this part sounds clunky. This part's boring. That isn't funny. That feels awkward. And just listening to it and like doing a lap around my block, I can cut like half of it out before I take it to the stage. Damn, dude. And then from there, I feel like I feel like you can get a bit from like zero to like fifty on the page, but you fifty to hundred I think has to happen on stage. I think it's bad to tinker with a bit on the page too much. Cause that's I'll, not how you perfect it. I don't think. How long did it take you to kind of realize that to where like you couldn't just write and that you had that you had that that fifty percent had to be on stage? And how did you kind of like work that muscle to get better at it? I think trial and error. I think, you know, a lot of times you can sit down and write something you think is totally badass on the page. Yeah. I mean, everyone's yeah. had this experience. Yeah. And then you go up and you say it and it's <laughs> fucking terrible. But in, in most times, you know, before you even say a word of it, you're like, this is fucking stupid. Like the second you're on stage with the mic in your hand and you cue up Damn. your whole monologue. Yeah. Immediately. Something about being on stage and having the people looking at you and having the mic, you're like, the way I approach this is way wrong. Like this is the, being being chained to this monologue feels really weird and unnatural. This is not the way I would say this. If you just handed me a mic and I think once I started doing an impro- improv mic, right, I learned a lot because I would draw a suggestion, which is like a premise, and then you just riff on it exactly, and that gets you accustomed to like how you would say something on stage. And I think you, the more and more you are there in the moment, the more and more you can channel that when you're sitting in front of a keyboard or whatever. Yeah. You're better able to anticipate, like, how would I say this? Not what are my ideas about it and how would I write it? Like, how would I actually say it out loud? Yeah. In a way that's compelling. And you, you, I think you got to be present. You, there's, there's comics you'll see that have, you'll see it all the time, people that have really clever ideas and they're really well written and they're really airtight. But when they say it, it's just not engaging. It just feels like they're just regurgitating something. Yeah. And that was me forever. Like, but I think the way you got to get away from that is you got to leave. You can't know everything you're going to say before you get up there. I think that's such a it's scary different for thing, everyone, for dude. me, for yeah. me at least. I, I, I like to leave a little bit of mystery because, because that keeps me excited about it. And the room can taste that. When you're up there having fun and you don't really know what you're gonna say next, yeah. they're like, "Oh shit!" Like they're they know you're there, and they can tell when you're not. I don't know how they know, but they do. It's a thing. It, it, it's a wild yeah. thing, dude. To fucking just like for me at this at this stage where I'm at, it's scary to think that people who are experienced like you go up there and it's just like, "All right, well, I got fifty percent of it." <laughs> you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Here comes the other fifty and yeah. shit like that. So I don't know, man. Like. Right now, I'm just trying to find my fucking process and, like, especially, like, the writing again, dude. Like, right now, 
I'm really struggling with it to where it's like, I don't know. Again, like I said, I don't know what my perspective is. You know, mm-hmm. how long did it take you to kind of find your voice to where, you, like you were saying earlier, how you were kind of nervous going to open mics? Yeah. You still probably are right now a little bit. Sure. But when did that, like, kind of st- not stop, but like get less and less nervous? Mm. Well, so, so it sounds like two different questions. When did I find my voice and when did I stop? Yeah. Feeling when nervous? Just, yeah. Which, well, yeah. Um, I, yeah, I guess which one do you mean? Do you mean like when wh- when did I find like my perspective? Right, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, I don't um I think I I've had people some people think that maybe I this definitely doesn't come easy to me doing stand up. Um I haven't been doing it a super long time, but I've been developing a voice or whatever as a someone who thinks about comedy f- for like 10 years, you know, writing sketches, writing screenplays. I've been writing stand-up bits since I was like 15. I just never wow. had the balls to go up and try it. Right. You know, I was 20, 25 the first time I did it. Um, and, and you know, I probably have fucking archives full of like garbage stand-up bits I've been writing forever. True. I mean, yeah. ever since I was a teenager. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that is, in a way, developing your voice. Anytime you're... You have an idea and you try to bring it to life. Mm-hmm. You're developing some kind of way you do that, and um, yeah, all the like the stand up is kind of like the tip of the iceberg for me in terms of the amount of time I've spent just figuring out how to make something funny or yeah. interesting. Yeah, so I've I've been I've failed at it so much, just like that. You just had nothing to do but then get better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I so I think I don't know. It's taken a lifetime i guess you would say maybe for anybody i mean you started yeah. developing your voice when you were a kid telling dick jokes at the lunch table you were working on your voice then sure. you don't just if you start doing stand-up when you're 22 it's not like you just find yourself materializing on stage at 22 with no perspective and no personality and no viewpoint like those that's true those are all things you've developed through your whole life everyone you've known and met all the weird fucking opinions you have your family members and friends your experiences um, but yeah, it's, it's a, takes a while to be that person on stage. You mm-hmm. know, I, I think the, the more I hear experienced comics talk about it, it sounds like the irony of it is that it takes 10 years maybe just to find out how to be the person you already are when you're up there. That's so um, wild. Bro. The, 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 the place you wind up at is just right at like who you already were. Um, hmm. and that's kind of what's interesting to me about it. You're not. Stand up isn't about learning how to be this comic or be this character. It's about being authentic and being who right. you are. And that's weirdly not a very intuitive thing to do when you're <laughs> on a stage with a mic in your hand and people looking at you. The weirdness of that makes you play a character or try to do something else. But the less you can do that, the better you're off you are, I think. Um so yeah, I don't know. I I don't I didn't feel I'd, I'd say it took me about eight months of doing stand up like every day before I started to feel a little looser of where like, OK, I don't need to know exactly what I'm going to do. Like I can even to when I would start to just riff off the comic before me. It took me a while to even have the balls to try that. It took me a while. But okay. once I started doing that, it opened a whole new. I was like, wow, this is way more fun now. Yeah, dude. Because now yeah. you you go to a mic, you have a reason to pay attention to everybody. Cause right. You're like. And you can be cooking jokes even when you're sitting there. Exactly, dude. It's easy to think of a mic as like, oh, I'm only going to practice for five minutes and then sit there for 50. No, if you're thick cooking up riffs, you can be the whole hour you can be working. Yeah. Um, so that's big, too. And I, I've seen people do that where, like, even yesterday at the improv, fucking, I forget who it was, but dude didn't even take a topic out of the bucket. He just riffed on every. I think it was Justin Borland. Mm. And he riffed off, riff off everybody's shit, dude. And yeah. that, to me, is just like, that's wild because... Like what you said, you're fucking writing as you're sitting there. You know what I mean? So yeah. just that that muscle of him just writing so quickly is fucking really impressive. Mm. It makes the mic go by quicker, too. Absolutely. <laughs> it gives you something to do, yeah. a reason to pay attention, and it makes it fun. And it's, and it, it, I don't know. Go, I, I feel like for me, when I, it's hard for me to go up and open with material. Even at a show, mm. it feels so awkward to go up there and just be like, so here's what I think about <laughs> this. The room's like, who the fuck are you? Like, it's <laughs> weird. So I've always felt like a riff is such a natural way in. Like an introduction. 
Yeah, because you, yeah, you when you're riffing, you can't help but be yourself. Because you're saying something that you've never said before. You're just reacting in the moment. So to me, it feels like such a natural way to come up on stage and just anchor yourself in who you actually are. If you come up and just start doing a bit, for me, I can like wind up just like doing the comic voice or whatever the mm. fuck and feeling fake. Yeah. You know? Um, so that, the riffing, the improv mics are huge, man. Dude, I, I can't even tell. Like, so... Uh, I started actually with just doing improv mics. I mean, I did oh, open really? mics too, but I noticed that just to get comfortable on stage was just improv. And every time, like even and now, I'm great at the improv, but when the next hour with the open mic, bro, it you can just see the difference, or I feel the difference at least. Like on the improv, I'm natural. I can go up there and riff off shit. Right. And then when I do the open mic, I'm completely different. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to break out of that, dude. Yeah. Any just suggestions with that? How to feel just that, that just how to feel normal when it's an open mic compared to an improv. Mm. I mean, I don't think you have to look at them as so different. I think you can still riff at a normal mic. A lot of people do. I, I like to. Right. Like, um, I like something Bill Hicks said where he said, um, your act is what you fall back on when you can't think of anything else to say. Your act is like a parachute. Like, ideally, you could go up there and just talk shit about something that's occurring on the night you know just everything that's happening then and there if you could put a whole set together based on that like that's honestly ideal i think at least in like a club or a mic setting not if you're fucking a big comic doing theaters and shit but um for me like yeah I, it, it started happening to me where my sets would like the riffs would be the high point and then i'd start doing material and my set would just go Poom. Because the room could just tell I wasn't having as much fun. Oh, shit. It was like, okay, now I'm doing homework. Yeah. You know? Whereas the riffing is, it's way funner. Right, Because it's just yeah. light and it's free and it tends to work way better. I don't I don't know. But it's a way harder skill to develop, I think. Like, I think it's good if that you feel better doing that. Because I think a lot of people only feel comfortable doing material for a really long no time. No kidding, dude? I think really? most people, yeah. The riffing thing does not come... I don't think it's easily to as many people. It's, really? It's hard to do. I'm not saying I'm even good at it. I'm saying right. I know a lot of a lot of really good comics that prefer to just do material. And and it's probably a more important skill to do material yeah, because it's going to be the meat of what you're doing. <laughs> that's very true. And I think it's way harder to do. I think if there's one like central trick to comedy that you have to solve, that's like the number one mystery all the comics I've talked to just like standing on the sidewalk till 2 a.m. chopping it up, uh -huh. talking about comedy theory or whatever the fuck you want to call it. Mm -hmm. It seems like the one mystery everyone's trying to crack is how do you do a bit that you've done a hundred times and make it feel like it's the first time you've said it? How, how do you give the audience the sense that you're coming up with this right then? Right. How can you be engaging enough with something that you know from front to back to just make it feel immediate? and fresh it's really hard because you you'll write a bit maybe it'll suck and then you'll get it to work and it'll be good and then you'll have a fuckload of fun telling it for like two weeks right and then it just starts this <laughs> slow death yeah where dude. you don't like it anymore it starts to just feel rote and repetitive bro and i'm at just that going through the motions and it's fucking i have no fucking idea what the answer to that question is no kidding that's dude. that's the skill that i think you gotta learn and i uh, no one seems to have an answer that i know what the fuck? Dude? I mean, there's tricks you can play, but it, that's a very common pattern. I have no fucking idea. I have so many bits that my bits seem to have a shelf life of like a few weeks. Like I'll love them and then I'll stop loving them and then they stop working. And it's weird because you can say you could go up and cr the first time a, a bit ever works really well and like everything hits. For me, that's the best the bit will ever be. Yeah. Like, that'll yeah, just man. be perfect, and it's so hard to recapture that. Yeah, right? It's like you're a crackhead. Like, that first hit of the pookie <laughs> is so good, and then you can, you're can you always chasing that. What the fuck did you call a pookie? A pookie, yeah. Is that it's, what they call it? It's the like street? a slang word for a crack pipe, yeah. No sh a pookie? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or a meth that. pipe. But, um, <laughs> but, yeah, I don't know. It's tough. It's not that it's impossible. That's mm -hmm. just something you got to. I think it, well, what I'll do is I'll put a bit on the shelf, and I won't do it for, like, a month. And then I'll dust it off again, and it'll be kind of fun again. But it's Dang, like dude, that's wild. I don't bro. know. Yeah, I have no idea. It's the hardest thing. So wild. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I don't know. I, I can't help you with that. That's, 
I would say just mix it up. Don't do the same shit too often. Right. Or if you're going to go to different places. Yeah, that's oh. what I've started to do. And then now it's just like I go to places now where sometimes I won't say the mic, but <clears throat> we're just this mic I go to, everyone there is fucking good. You know what I mean? And it's just like I stay away from that kind of shit because it's like, dude, these guys are like super experienced. Mm-hmm. And, then I'll, and then I'll stay at fourth wall because it's like I know people there. I'm comfortable. You know what I mean? But then it's like fucking with me because when I see pe- new people, I'm not as confident as I am. I'm fucking weird on stage. Yeah. So that's well, that's the thing. I I get I've gotten lazy and I'll go to the same three or four mics mm. where I know everybody. Yeah. And it's like a home game. It's easy. Right. Every, you go in, your friends are there. Everybody right. knows you. They yeah. already get you. They yeah. already like you. And then you can just go up there and you'll start having inside jokes with people. Exactly. And, and that's when banter. I feel like comedies it, like start your comedy starts to suck is where everything starts to become an inside joke. Yeah. Well, and also you you get this inflated sense of confidence that mm. doesn't. It isn't real because then the, you'll go to another mic where no one gives a fuck about you and you'll feel like a little naked schoolboy up right. there and you'll like totally bomb. You'll not feel loose at all. And you're like, oh, wow, like th- this is a problem because it, <laughs> most of doing comedy is getting up in front of a crowd that doesn't know who the fuck you are and doesn't care about you. So if you can't be loose and fun in that situation, that's something you got to work on, you know? So yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'll, anytime I. I get stuck going to these mics because they're convenient and they're safe and they're comfortable. And then Mm -hmm. I'll go to a new mic and I'll just fucking suck. And I'll be like, damn, I need to do that more. Yeah. Like, that's where I, to me, that's a sign. Like, that's what I should be doing. Going to new mics. Going to new mics where no one gives a fuck about me. Yeah. Yeah. That's where, like, I'm going to actually grow. Right. Or learn something. And is that your kind of process now where you're trying to hit new mics, like, at least a new mic every day almost? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to do it every day, but definitely trying to lean less on, you know, the two mics I go to all the time. I'm just like, okay, I'm going to try to not go to those for like two weeks Mm -hmm. and fill the days up with something else. And that's, you learn a lot more about yourself. It's so when you go up in front of a room of strangers, it's like they're just holding a mirror up to you. You can suddenly see yourself so much more clearly through their eyes. Yeah, dude. Because you're just kind of like, oh, wow, this is how a group of strangers perceives me. And all these bits feel... Not as power. I don't feel nearly as powerful. Exactly, as dude. And I'll fucking throw yeah. away bits because of that shit sometimes. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. And then like, I don't know, dude. This is just a weird thing. Like, again, this whole podcast is just me trying to learn comedy, and it's like, I can learn. I can only learn so much. Yeah. You know what I mean? To where it's just like you just got to go do it. Yeah, that's the thing too. Is it's, it's. I don't know. It's nice to listen to good comics talk about it on podcasts, and you know stand on the corner chopping it up with other people and thinking about it but yeah the real learning does seem to be more you could fill your head with concepts about what you should do and what will make you better and Mm -hmm. but none of that has that much cash value when you're fucking up there right i think you do learn a lot just through exposure through osmosis it's like i think the way you learn anything is it has to become kind of subconscious Hmm. like someone that's a great free throw shooter probably isn't up there thinking like I need to flex my wrist and my finger at this exact Mm. angle. My release needs to be at this point. Like they're not thinking that like a guy hitting a baseball, just his body's reacting before his brain even knows what the fuck is happening. Like, I think you just have to do something enough that through osmosis, you just get this kind of innate sense for how to do it. Uh, And that, I don't know how long that takes to happen, but I don't know if, I don't think you can just install all these, rules in your head right because when you're up there you can't think about any of that you yeah to, that's true you know so yeah i think just doing it over and over and over and over yeah and 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 bombing is really important right dude. I've, I, I've avoided it so much i'm such a <laughs> pussy i'm always like <laughs> here, dude. i'm always like ah you know i don't want to i want to go to the mic where i know everybody and crush <laughs> that sounds way nicer and then i'm like oh here's a mic full of like really good comics that don't give a fuck about me like ah, i can't make it that's far Gas is expensive. Yeah. Ah, I'll just come up with I'm a million tired. excuses. Yeah. yeah. Like, ah, I'll go there when I'm feeling really good. But I think the thing is, you the more you go into scary situations and do shit before you're ready, I find that that's the, a better way to build confidence. Mm. Like going to a place where you're comfortable, you're not really building confidence. Right. You're just yeah. doing something that's already easy for you. When, but, um, shit, I forgot what I was going to ask. Yeah. 
I don't know. Well, the more you can throw yourself in the fire and land on your feet, the, the more you'll be willing to like keep doing that. Yeah. And, and usually it'll go better than you think. Usually. Have have you gone to like an open mic where you didn't have any material and you just kind of just, or at least just like maybe you know you didn't have five minutes, but you just had maybe like a minute or two and you're just like, all right, I'm going to go there and just kind of fuck it. Mm. Because I find myself right now like not having enough for five minutes, not having enough oh. new stuff for five minutes, you know? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. For me, I've been writing awful comedy for so long, mm. dude. I just have an endless amount of bullshit I could try. Like I have... Mm. I'm not saying any of it's good. I'm saying like I have tomes of like bullshit. Like I could, I could go up for months, maybe like a month, and do a new sh- thing at every mic. Like some half baked shitty idea. I yeah. got a bunch of things to try. Um, so I'm never hurting for something to try really. Mm-hmm. Um, mainly because, like I said, I've been writing comedy for ten years and doing it for two. So I have this like huge stack of just like. You know, those like old dusty cans you find in the back of your pantry. Yeah. It's like sliced peaches from like 1997. <laughs> I have a fuckload of that, dude, just sitting in there gathering dust. So I can always be like, oh, I'll try this. Um, but, so I don't find myself like not being able to fill five minutes. Um, but sometimes I'll go to a mic and not do what I thought I was going to do. Hmm. I'll, I'll have I'll, I'll usually just write down like a little grab bag of things I might want to try. Just topics? Yeah, like like a bit, like in my notebook. I'll oh, okay. just write down like 10 bits. I'm like, these are ones I want to try today or tomorrow. And then when I'm up there, I'll just pick a few. And they're obviously not fleshed out. Like maybe it's just like a bit and then bullet points. I mean, mm, Most varies. of them are, are, are fleshed out enough. God By the time damn. I'm going to try it on stage, usually I'm like, I have an outline. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jesus, man. I'm starting to write things back in a little more detail. For a while, I was just being loose with it Mm -hmm. but something about going back and forth i think makes you every time i step away from being like a technician and writing then when i come back to doing that again i do it with a little more perspective and i um, overdo it a little less it's almost like i'll i'll fill the soup with salt for like a month and then the soup is so fucking salty that i'll get used to that taste and i'll be like oh this is how everything tastes but then I'll like, so that would be me like writing way too much, like overwriting, for example. And then I'll stop for a while. I'll be like, fuck salt. I'm not going to use any of it. And then when I come back to using salt again, all I need is like a pinch. And I'm like, ooh, I could taste that. That's good. And, and, and that way the salt actually enhances the dish. It doesn't like over fucking whelm it so that you're just eating salt soup. You're just like, oh, this is just a good soup with the right amount of salt. <laughs> Bro, that's a good that, analogy, bro. Right? It's kind of clumsy. but Honestly, a good analogy, though. Like, it, uh, that's what writing's like for me. Where it's like, yeah, I need to be a little more judicious with it. I can't just sit there and nerd out on every sentence mm. or things become way too dense mm. and they're way hard for a room to relate to. Yeah. Uh, and then if I'm only writing on stage, I think things are a little too loose and they don't really have much structure. I'm not nearly a good enough comic to just like perfectly form some bit with like a nice roundness to it that's all punchy, like just on stage. So just being like, judicious with the amount of writing I use, you know, kind of giving something the bones and then I can go up and refine it. You, you said coming back full circle. What, what are the, I guess, bullet points of you doing that with a bit of like, of you obviously exactly. said there's like a setup and then, you know, what, like, what is, what is your, am uh, I, I don't uh, know how to ask this question. Damn oh, it. like how do I look at like the structure? Of yeah, it, yeah. 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 I don't, that's one thing I've, I've, uh, I don't know. Um, it's just feeling. I've, I've never thought about. I've never thought about anything in terms of like a setup and punchline. That doesn't really. I know what that kind of means, I guess, but I kind of don't. Um, it's kind of like, yeah, when people think in those terms of like setup, a lot of comics do, and like, that's I think also kind of maybe more of a traditional East Coast thing to be way more about just like mm. rapid fire, quick jokes. I see. Um, I think that's why comics have always gone to New York. Right. To, they say you go there to get good and you go here to get famous or whatever. That, you know, that's a cliche, but um, I've never thought about jokes. I, I don't understand the science of joke writing like at all. So I'd be like, I'm basically like a dude that does not know how to read music at all, but I can like, I know a few chords and I can like find them, but I have no idea how to read music. Like, I don't know. What the fuck is happening? Right. Like when I, I just know that I think something's funny and then sometimes it isn't and sometimes it is. 
sometimes I don't think it's funny and it winds up being funny. Like the lines I don't expect are going to do anything wind up hitting. And then sometimes things I think are fucking like zingers get fucking fall Nothing, completely yeah. flat. And I don't really know why a lot of the time. I'm just like, okay, I guess <laughs> that's, I guess that works. I'm just kind of groping around. Yeah. Huh. Um, but I think the more you grope or the more I grope, it's like I'm in a dark room. The more I get this sense of just like, eh, I don't think that's the right direction to walk. I think it's more, I'm getting warmer over here or whatever. Yeah. But I don't, I never think of anything in terms of like, I don't know what joke structure even means. Like I literally have no fucking idea. <laughs> I love um, it. I know that I know how to like. We all know how to like cut fat out of things. I think. Yeah, yeah. And all the years I spent video editing, I think, help with that. Where I can, I think uh, it's easy for me to like, especially if I can see it on a page. That's where I get addicted to writing shit. I can like see all the fat, like trim it out, and I can go like, oh, that could move there, that could move there. But you can definitely overdo that and mangle things because you can just. For me, I can just like over engineer it. To where it's like, okay, it's airtight and like efficient, but that doesn't mean it's funny. Um, but the the best bits sometimes, like the best bits have like a like a roundness to them, where they start and then they end on this like nice line that's like a banger that like perfectly ties everything together. I've very rarely written a bit like that, mm -hmm. but when I do, it just kind of happens and it feels like a fluke. I'm just like, holy shit! All right, that bit's <laughs> just like a nice set that on the shelf. <laughs> But usually my bits just kind of like will just like trail off or just end on some <laughs> weird, absurd note. And I'm like, all right, I'm done talking yeah. about that. Next thing. <laughs> but yeah, good comics, when you watch a good comic, like one thing, too, I have no idea how to do is like transitions. Mm -hmm. Like when mm -hmm. you watch a special, you don't even really notice them switching topics. No, You're just kind of led along and they can hide all the seams really well. True. And that's really admirable. Sometimes I'll try to like watch a special and be like, how does he do that? How is he flowing from one thing to the next um i don't do that i just go up on stage and i do a bit and then it ends and then i'll just go like i'll be talking about like butt sex or something and i'm like and uh okay so anyway cilantro <laughs> and <laughs> it's totally rough and weird and people kind of accept it because i think i'm not doing i'm doing shows at like these shitty little punk rock venues so it's not like people are expecting me to be a master true okay. but i definitely don't know Something about trying to write a transition feels really awkward to me, really forced mm. for me to go from like sex to like garden herbs. I'd have to be like, yeah, sex is very natural. You know what else is natural herbs? It's it feels very stilted. Um, but I had like a weird epiphany recently where I was like the, when you're talking to someone, having a conversation, it's totally normal for a, you, you ever talk to a friend and then you're talking about dating or fucking money or whatever the fuck you're talking about and then 15 minutes later you're talking about like sea turtles yeah. or like mayans yeah. and you'll be like wait how the fuck did we get to this and you can even go in your head and trace back like oh yeah well this made us think of that and that made us think and you can go all the way back oh wow so we're actually in conversation all the time we're doing that oh, we're just wow, daisy chaining like oh this made me think of that and you know when you're having a conversation and your friend will bring up something that seems weird, yeah, and you're all waiting like, okay, wait, how are you going to tie this to that thing? And then they do it, and you go, ah, this is why you're talking about that. So I think it's very, we're all very used to that process. And I had this thought the other day. I was like, oh, you can just do that with your set, and people will just intuitively know what you're doing because in conversation we're constantly just free associating, like, oh, you talked about butt cheeks, and that made me think of the dude. I went to. Del Taco last week, and I tried the bacon double Dell, and, uh, and then you're talking about shitting yourself. Yeah, oh, yeah. butt cheeks. You're, oh, I get it. That kind of thing. So I don't know. I think you can be kind of free with it. Like I think we think the audience is going to question a lot of things that they actually don't question. Like I think we over prepare a lot of the time. We go like, oh, they're not going to get. If Damn, I don't like, if yeah. I don't set this up enough, they're not going to know what I mean by this and that. And then you'll do the joke. And all that setup, you realize, is just fat and no one gives a fuck. And a lot of times, you can just take a big leap and people get it. Yeah. Like, people are good at connecting dots, like, better than we think, I think. And I think it's pleasurable for an audience to do that. You know when you're watching something and you kind of, like, know where they're going? And yeah, you yeah. Th that's a nice feeling. You're like, oh, I'm in on this. I know what he's going to do. I, I get it. That feels good. Yeah. I, I think when you patronize the audience and you beat them over the head with shit, they can kind of be, a, it's not as fun for them. Because nothing's going to surprise them. It feels too on the nose, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I think good comics are like that. They'll, yeah. They give you the least amount of information possible almost. 
and their bits have like are light on their toes in this way that they're not when when you when you're newer and right yeah like you got to over explain everything yeah exactly dude yeah. exactly yeah god damn bro 50 minutes already jesus christ this has is it really fast, been an hour almost bro. dude it feels like it's 20 minutes we've been yeah. talking wow bro. that's weird fuck man um what kind of screenplays do you write obviously comedy and stuff yeah, like, yeah. i mean i think maybe that was part of what led me astray is they kind of weren't pure comedy like i i i think the first one i wrote was more comedy um it was a i was a i worked in construction for a long time uh like landscaping i was just kind of like a grunt uh-huh. um and i would just work on like i did landscaping for a while job sites and I just, it was just like me and like a bunch of Guatemalan dudes. And, um, th- and then I went from that to working for this like total, this fucking influencer that was, it was the complete opposite culture. Just all these really douchey vloggers. Yeah, They're man. very vain, pointing cameras at themselves. Yeah, and man. I remember there were times where I was, I would go back and forth from doing construction to then working with these like douchey hmm. YouTube vloggers. Mm-hmm. I'm like these worlds could not be any more different. Like, yeah, when I'm doing manual labor, I'm working with people that are just like salt of the earth, hardworking, yeah. grateful for what they have, and then I'm going from that to working with the most just like vain, pampered, fucking obnoxious, yeah, dude, whiny fucking people. And I, I, I had this thought about like wh- what would like a lot of times I'd be in this room full of these like influencer dudes, and I'd be like, what would like oscar think of these fucking people like the dude i'm working with the like leathery like salvadoran <laughs> carpenter like what if he could see these dudes what the fuck he wouldn't even have any understanding of like w- wait these people get paid for this what the fuck are they doing like yeah, dude like these are people working with their hands all day doing shit that's hard and has like a concrete result yeah like yeah, building a yeah. fucking house yeah. you know for someone to live in <laughs> and then these other dudes are like going to Pinkberry and like fucking videotaping their <laughs> stupid comedy. It's just so weird. And like, I, I wrote this screenplay that was about like a first generation immigrant labor of being thrust into like the influencer world. That's kind of a dope story, dude. It's kind of weird right now. I wasn't the right guy to write it mm, though. Like it, mm. that shouldn't be written by a white dude. I don't <laughs> understand their culture enough to like, yeah, what would it be like? I know what a first generation South man yeah. with that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I was trying to like, the premise was that, you know, one of these guys w- winds up being in some like viral like TikTok kind of thing and becoming like a booty model because like some girl <laughs> walking by a job site sees his butt cheeks and his butt cheeks are really buff from like doing construction all day and like picking up bags of concrete and pushing a wheelbarrow and he's got like firm, thick cheeks and then chicks are like sniping videos of his ass and then it winds, he winds up going viral on TikTok unbeknownst to him. And then people start thrusting cameras in his face and interviewing him. And he's like, oh, what the fuck? And then he finds himself like, he's like, whatever, I'll do this. If I can like support my family and like bring them to America. Bro, that that is a fucking, uh, I would watch that movie, bro. That is fucking yeah, hilarious. It's, it's an interesting idea, but I'm not the guy to write it. You know what I mean? Like I thought I was, but I think that was very, I was, yeah. I, I, I think it was pretty vain of me to think like I could get in the head of this dude. It's like, just because I work with, you know, dudes that are f- from other countries and fucking don't speak English and yeah. have that doesn't mean I understand at all what the fuck it's like to be them yeah. cuz like for me it's like I can it's so much easier for me to like find other opportunities I have like a college education I'm like from like a middle class family like it's I I I can't take on the that other person's perspective at all so but I, I nonetheless I'm like I'm going to fucking write a movie about this yeah. and I, <laughs> I learned a lot writing like mm-hmm. it was fun and mm-hmm. I think uh I I didn't think I could write a feature film. I never would have tried, but I just kind of found myself yeah, doing dude. it. And I think that was the first time I realized, like, with something creative, you can just kind of put one foot in front of the other, mm-hmm. and the path kind of, like, comes into focus as you walk it somehow. Yeah. So I, I learned a lot from it. I mean, it's definitely just going to, like, sit in a fucking drawer forever, but I wrote, like, a fucking stupidly long, like, 150-page screenplay. God damn, bro. And then the... With a million drafts, and then I thought I'd turn it into like a <clears throat> limited series, yeah. and I wrote like three episodes of that, and I don't know, it was cool. But um, yeah, then the second thing I wrote, I tried to be, I wanted to be taken all seriously as like an auteur, and I wrote this kind of like pitch black comedy about like a like a nefarious sperm bank, <laughs> <laughs> where there's like this doctor that's there's like this weird 
it turns out that the, it's like this weird Swiss company. It's like this really high end <laughs> sperm bank where you can like shop for s- sperm donors on this database. Where you can like see like oh here's like a buff like, like six a foot almost. seven Nordic man yeah. who <laughs> plays the cello and has like a nine inch cock and sp- talks to deaf kids. It's like a boutique sperm donor shop where like couples can go shop yeah. on like an iPad, and uh, <laughs> and then it turns out one of the doctors there is like feels lesser than because all these donors are these like total studs and the doctors like this <laughs> kind of skinny ugly dude so he starts like impregnating patients with his own jizz and then Bro. weirdly i thought that was such a unique twist and then like like 10 different movies came out about that about like doctors it's well i think that it, impregnated it, patients with their own it was cum. a true story there's yeah a, there's i like guess it's happened dude. a bunch of times dude yeah. there's some dude there's a netflix documentary of it there's mm-hmm. this dude who had like yeah. Hundreds of kids. Yeah, that's Dude, what there's like doing. multiple shows about it. That's wild. So, bro. which happened like right after I was like poured a year of my life in this dumbass movie. <laughs> <laughs> that was the one I showed my home, and he was like, "Uh, eh. screenwriting's hard, though, bro." I, it's I got very hard. I got a couple yeah. scripts. Um, one of them, fucking, you ever seen that movie, Peanut Butter Falcon, with Shia LaBeouf? Yes, I did. Yeah. So one of the production companies who produced it hit me up because they saw a short film of mine, and they're like, "You got anything you're working on?" And I sent them the script, and they loved it. Yeah. But it was just they were looking for more world building movies to where they could spend like fifty million dollars to wow. make it. Yeah, okay. my shit was very independent, very indie, very low budget type shit. So and, did they try to option some screenplay or? They were um, they were re- they were looking to and then well the, it was like an assistant over there and he got my screenplay, gave me notes, I gave him back a, a draft and he took it to his people and they were just like we're not looking for these kind of movies anymore. We're like moving mm. up okay. type shit. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you do now? Like, you're doing all right. This is a fucking nice place. Uh, well, you know, this is my girl. My girl's fucking supporting me, you know what I mean? Oh, uh, yeah? <laughs> not, 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 you must have a fucking hog in your <laughs> pants, dude. She's putting up with your amateur comedy, and you don't even bring home the bacon, huh? No, I'm just doing fucking Uber Eats right now. I was producing before, and then fucking... The way Hollywood went, man, I just couldn't yeah. do it anymore, man. Yeah. I couldn't, dude. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all about fucking equality and all that shit but just to be fucking shoved down my throat and then after the pandemic fucking walking back on set was completely different bro yeah. you know what i mean like i, I just couldn't do it walking man. back on set is what in what capacity um yeah. well coming back after the pandemic and all that you know the george floyd blm stuff and there was it was so divided right. everyone was so divided to where it, it just was un, it wasn't fun anymore being on set mm. you know what i mean there was uh, there, not that i you would say anything but it was just like just people looking at you different, right? Like before 2020 happened, every, every, I, I, everyone seemed like they were happy to be on set. You know what I mean? Of, of course it's grueling. These fucking long 12 hour days are grueling, but we all love to be there and we, the relationships would grow. And I couldn't find anything like that after the pandemic. And then hmm. I never got vaxxed. So fucking, I was basically fucking blacklisted from Hollywood. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then, so I just did like freelance producing after that. And now I'm just like, I'm completely over it. And, I stepped into comedy and I was like, wow, I can actually say things without feeling like I'm being judged. Mm. You know what I mean? And it became like a comfort thing. And then I just brought the skills that I knew of from when I was making films and then started this podcast to kind of not only learn, but to meet other comedians, you know what I mean? Get myself in the community and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, But yeah, dude, it was just a weird time. And like, I'm honestly like, as rough it is as it is right now with financial stuff and like career wise, I'm having the most fun right now, dude. Yeah. Honestly, I'm. It's just it. It's so incredible how this community, especially in LA, is open minded. Yeah, you know what I mean. Right. That was you couldn't do that on film sets, dude. Like I always tell people, if anything, I were to talk about anything that I felt like was my perspective, I'd be burned to the stake and not be invited back on that set ever again. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean. And mm-hmm. to me, that's weird because. People talk about our rights and free speech, and it's just like that's you don't see that on set. You don't. Yeah, it's what I don't know. I always had trouble making friends in LA because it's just hard, dude. Yeah, dude. But like, like I always felt yeah, like I was bro. on this island by myself. Yeah, bro. Uh, write like writing and doing sketches. Um, but once I did comedy, like the people, I didn't think I'd make so many friends. Right, dude. It's such a cool community. Right, yeah. bro. Because uh, there's these caricatures in LA, like everyone's fake or superficial or just trying to network but i find comics to just be like the realest the coolest real, fucking people agreed bro so the realest motherfuckers yeah dude. that's one thing i did not expect going into it i didn't think i would make so many good friends same here and i'm making yeah. friends where like even like outside of comedy where i'd be like i don't see myself being that dude's friend you know what i mean but because of comedy it's just like dude we have we're 
and because I see these people almost every day on stage, we have so much in common. Right. You know? So it's, it's, it's just a great feeling to do this. I mean, I, I was like you, fucking, I went to my first open mic, like, fucking 2015. And I had my fucking three minutes or whatever in San Francisco. And I was like three people up and everyone before me had bombed. And I just got in my head and I left. I didn't even do it. And mm. I didn't start it until three months ago. And I'm fucking 34 now. Yeah. You're you know, 34? I'm 34, bro. What the fuck, bro? <laughs> yeah. I'm 34. Are you really? Yeah. Oh, shit. Okay. I thought you were like 25. No, dude. dude yeah, I'm 34, bro. Wow, you look good, dude. Yeah, I didn't think you yeah. were fucking 34 either. I thought you were in your 20s still. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah, no, 34, dude. Started again at... Right on the basically right before my thirty third birthday, dude. I started yeah. fucking the day before my thirty fourth. Literally, really? I fucking no, I went out to Vegas because that's where I'm originally from. Yeah. I went to Wise Guys out there for an open mic and had this bit about the first time I used to work in healthcare. Had this bit about the first time I saw a patient die, mm -hmm. and it was a three minute set, bro. And a minute in, I was stuttering. I couldn't get any laughs, and then I was bombing. And I it's on my Instagram, but I was telling myself, "Oh my god, I'm fucking bombing." And then I just started riffing. And had the whole fucking place going crazy, dude. Mm. And I, so I walked off, and I was like, I'm never doing this again. And, dude, it was crazy because, like, three or four comedians came up to me and was like, bro, this is your first time. You have to keep doing this. I'm like, what? I just bombed. Yeah. My girlfriend, too, she was like, no. And what's wild about it, before I did that mic, my girl was like, you don't want to do this as a career, do you? And then I was like, God damn it. <laughs> and, but after I stepped off stage, she was like, you have to keep doing this. Really? Yeah. yeah. This was in Frisco? This was, no, uh, Vegas. Oh, Vegas. In Vegas, yeah. This okay. was fucking May 31st of this year, right? Oh, the day wow. before my birthday. Oh, no way. Yeah, dude. Okay. So, damn. yeah, that's this is what, uh, this is what I'm doing now. So I don't yeah, know what's yeah. going to happen, but fucking, yeah. I'm having fun doing it, bro. And like yeah. you said, I'm meeting great people. Great fucking people. Man. Sure. Yeah. No, that's been the most. I guess I used to think of this like it's something like like a solo sport, something you got to do by yourself. I thought you're just like this lone fucking soldier, just like yeah. trudging through the rain and bombing and like eating shitty meals at a diner yeah. at 2 a.m. and like chain smoking, like banging <laughs> yeah. hookers. But like, I don't know. The more I do, I'm like, dude, this is not like that at all. Not at all, dude. Like it's like this super warm community of like awesome people. Yeah, do people want to write with you and shit? Yeah. I got invited to like go, go write at like a fucking uh, diner. I was like, no way, yeah. dude. Like this is what you guys want to yeah. do? I did that the other week. It was super nice. I felt like I was in a Tarantino movie. It's just like Bob's big boy in like a booth with some comics <laughs> yeah, writing dude. dick jokes. I was like, this is fucking sweet. Right, dude? Yeah. So that's been like really cool. I, I, I did not expect it to be like that. I mean, obviously, comedy's still fucking scary, and <laughs> there's the ups and downs are fucking crazy. But yeah, another thing I noticed now is like it used to kind of annoy me, but I guess I, I think it's a good sign is that when I started doing comedy in L.A., I'm like, dude, so many of these comics are like well-adjusted people with good lives. Like I see all these comics that are like, this person's funny and they're hot and they're in a healthy relationship and they make like six figures. Yeah. I'm like, what the fuck? I thought we were all supposed to be like broke and ugly and suck ass. <laughs> and I, it, but I guess what, I, and I was like, dude, like when I started, you know, last year I'm working at a deli, I'm making minimum wage. I'm like covered in mustard all day. I'm in total shambles. I'm single. I'm broke. And I'm like, this is how this is supposed to be. It's supposed to suck ass. Yeah. You know, I go to work, I get covered in fucking beef juice, and then I go bomb. <laughs> and then I go home, and I beat off, and I go to bed like a man. <laughs> With the beef juice. <laughs> yeah, but then, like, dude, I would go to fourth wall, those improv mics. I don't know, I didn't get banned from those. I would leave the deli and then go straight to fourth wall, just smelling like fucking beef. <laughs> smelling like meat, dude. But the fourth wall is the one place. I'm like, fuck <laughs> these people. I don't care if I smell like shit. Like, um, <laughs> but no, like, I, the more I do it, the more I'm like... Like, I got, like, a little bit of a better job, and, like, I feel less shitty about myself, and mm. I'm like, oh, this isn't making me a worse comic. Like, my life becoming nicer isn't hurting me. Huh. I think it's easy to have this idea, especially with comedy, where, like, this all comes from suffering. And I think the impulse to, like, I think a lot of people develop a sense of humor because they're damaged, or it's some way to... Mm -hmm. Some way to cope, some right. way to keep a positive attitude mm -hmm. when things seem to be falling apart around you. But at a certain point, I don't know if pain has like and suffering have that much more to teach you. I think like that you reach this point where it might not be productive to keep being an alcoholic and to keep refusing to be a dateable person and to keep being self-destructive and wretched. There's a point where like if you got your car washed and get a haircut like you might go up on stage and feel a little better about yourself <laughs> that's what i'm realizing like i'm still a completely broke fucking loser but 
I take little steps to make my life better. And I'm like, eh, this actually makes me feel like doing comedy a little more. And maybe up on stage, I'm a little less forbidding and a little more inviting. I'm not like this fucking raggedy creature that goes up and huh. just talks about like, tr- like narcotics and cum and like dark stuff. Like I can actually go up there and seem like a warm person that you might like have over for dinner. I don't think it's the worst thing. That's interesting, you know? dude. You, I've never heard a comic say like this kind of perspective before. Really? That's int- yeah, I've never right. heard that. Because usually it's like the first part you said, we're all broken, you know what I mean? We all have fucking trauma that we just want to get up on stage. But I think you're right, dude. Like, Because you just feel better walking on stage when you're fucking well-kept. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. Not fucking Yeah, and then know, raggedy. too, that like we're not doing this. Ideally, we're not doing this to learn how to make people laugh in an open mic. Like That's where we have to train. Right. But what we're really trying to learn how to do is get up in front of a crowd mm-hmm. of like, and those people are like normal people. Like they take showers, they have jobs, <laughs> they have relationships. <laughs> they aren't like totally wretched weirdos. Like they we go are. to bed at ten. Yeah. So it's like if you want to connect with those people, like it, it's not that helpful to be like a total piece of shit. You know. Yeah. So I'm starting to realize that I'm so I, I thought I had to work at this shitty deli because I was like, I can't go get some like corporate job. Hmm. And I just go up there and be like a dry ass fucking. I still didn't get a corporate job. I just work at a less shitty <laughs> restaurant. <laughs> but still, like even that little step, I'm just like I'm probably more relatable as a person now, because I'm like, you know, just around when you're in a crowd, like they don't want to be. I, I heard something recently. I don't know who the fuck said it, but I think it's. I'm not into like breaking comedy down into these like principles and shit, but. Someone was saying, I usually just, my eyes glaze over when I reach it like this, but Mm -hmm. someone was saying comedy is this balance between safety and violation. So like you make the crowd feel safe and then you violate that Uh feeling and then you can, but the crowd can laugh at the violation because they feel safe. Yeah. So if the crowd never feels safe, then it's hard for them to laugh at all your transgressions. Like if you go up there and you talk about like mass shootings and you're some like dude with like a neck beard and you're all pasty and you look like you got a half written manifesto in your car. The room's gonna be like, is this dude like into this shit? Like, is he, you know, does this dude have a fucking beretta in his glove compartment? And, like a two liter of Mountain Dew and like, like, are they, but if you go up there and you're like an otherwise warm, kind of trustworthy, sensitive person and then you start talking about that topic. The room feels safe enough to go there with you because they're like, this guy's in a fucking weirdo. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I, it's okay to hear him go off on this lark. Yeah. But but I think the room needs to feel enough like, okay, I know what I'm looking at here. I, I, I think this person's coming from a good place. There, there's something there. So I think when I was starting, it was kind of like all violation and very little safety. Oh. And I'm starting to feel like there's more I could do to make the room feel a little safe. Oh. Like I could... And not safe in the sense that you're like coddling just them and being like, this is a safe space. No, no, yeah. no, but just like, you know, being a person that seems... Almost likable. Yeah, likable. Yeah. The, being, that, that's the, you know, there's not a better word than that. And, and likability is fucking important. And, and you can be likable in weird ways. Right, right. Like, you know, I'm not like all into Anthony Jeselnik, but that guy's character is an extremely unlikable person. Yeah. But somehow you like him. Right, dude. Because he's always got this like wry grin on his face and you know he's in on the joke. Yeah. And so that, so you know, you can be likable and still be like a total bastard. That's totally true. I, I, I think it comes with when they can, audience can tell there's this sprinkle of self awareness in there. It's like Bill Burr. He's always talking about being fucking angry yeah, and getting yeah. riled up over stupid yeah. shit. But he's constantly like, yeah, I know. I'm a fucking asshole. I know. Like, he knows it too. Yeah, yeah. So he's letting you know, like, he knows he's wrong. So there's something to that. Um, huh. Okay. And I think the more that the, the, the less miserable my day to day life becomes, the more inclined I am to like give the room a little more of a hug. And and I I, I the, the, something I started saying to myself was like sometimes I'd have sets and when I go into a room that's kind of dead or when I'm not feeling great, I I would tend to lean on grossness. Right. Right. A lot. It's like a yeah. problem I have. It's just kind of a crutch. I'm like, well, I know how to be really fucking gross. And yeah. Like that was some way to get a rise out of people. Mm-hmm. And it felt, even if they were groaning or cringing, I felt like I was in control. Mm. Like I didn't feel vulnerable anymore. Cause I'm like, I have the mic and I'm going to gross you the fuck out. And like, fuck you if you don't like it. But I, I don't think comedy is something you should like inflict on people. 
Like, it's not a weapon. I think it's mm. the whole point of it is to bring levity. Right. So, like, you can do that by being gross, but it, you need to balance it, I think. Yeah. Because uh, I, I definitely would get way too carried away with that. Mm. And I think the more happy I am, the less inclined I feel to make people feel uncomfortable or shock them just for the sake of doing it. Because, you know, you can shock people and make them laugh at the same time, but... I, 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 I tended to forget that. I was kind of like, well, you know, even if I go up here and I bomb, I stood my ground and I was nasty or whatever. But, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to do that as much now. Right. So, yeah, yeah. So I think that's a good thing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and that's the thing I feel like I was telling someone the other day. It's like it feels like newer comedians will do that. Because sure. it's, it's one of those things where you get maybe they won't get a laugh, but they'll get a reaction. You know what I mean? And um, yeah, yeah. that's something that where. I want to get rid of early. Like when I first started, I wasn't even doing like some of these improv. I wouldn't even do the dirty ones because I'm like, this is just too hacky. I can go way too deep into this. Right. right. You know what I mean? And I, yeah. that's not the kind of like the point. I, I'll still do it. You know, I've got bits where I fucking talk about fucking my little dick. Yeah. You know what I mean? But, and that won't get a laugh, but it'll get a reaction. And it's just like, okay, like now I'm starting to see what good comedians can do and what just kind of like what the hacky means. Cause that mm. took me a while to figure out what hacky is even was you know what i mean yeah it's it can start to feel like a cheap trick yeah it made me realize like why like the laugh factory their audition is clean exactly when it's clean yeah i used to think like oh that's fucking lame yeah but the more i thought about it i'm like it's kind of a good idea yeah because if you can be clean and funny i think that requires like a higher level of writing and skill absolutely you have to be able to make people laugh with just like cleverness absolutely and um it's not as easy to do so i think it filters out a lot of it, if you can do that, like I think, it takes a skilled comic to yeah. do it. So that, that I don't think clean comics are better than dirty comics, but I think even if you're a dirty comic, if you can set all that aside yeah. and still pull it off, that means you have like versatility. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and that's what you want, dude, because you never know what the crowd's like. Totally. Um. Well, dude, it's been fucking an hour, ten minutes, bro. Yeah, wow. This is, this was fucking the quickest fucking podcast I think in terms of just not even the time but just the feeling of it, bro. I really appreciate you coming out here, totally Brian. Dog. Really, Thank you for having me, man. absolutely, bro. Fun. Let's let the people know where they can find you. <clears throat> uh, you can find me on Instagram at uh, B Smite. It's just Brian Smite, uh, but just the B Smite S M I G H T. It's a weird spelling, but that's my name. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Brian. Again, like I said, bro, I really appreciate you, yeah. bro. And uh, thank you, everybody, again. Yeah, Later.